Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you um, for the, the gracious, gracious um, intro. I want to tell you um, that I, I am thrilled to be in this room. Uh, I believe the people in this room and the Freedom Caucus, uh, I have said over and over again, you guys need to run the country. Um, you have the answers. <clears throat> and we are... We're, we're, at a, we're at a weird place, aren't we? I mean, I've never wished I was wrong more than right now. Uh, and it has come, you know, it's, it's almost like how do people go bankrupt? Very slowly, and then all at once. Uh, and that's what's happening to us right now. And those of you who have the spine to stand up, you will be remembered. The, the words that... Um, Eisenhower said to the troops right before D-Day, the eyes of the world are upon you. That has been going through my head over and over and over again. A lot of us are going to be slaughtered on the beaches. But I will tell you, we win in the end because our cause is righteous. I wanted, to, uh, I wanted to bring you a couple of things uh, today. First of all, I wanted to bring you some, a couple of requests. Then I want to uh, give you some hope and bring you some really good news. And then I want to strengthen you a little bit with some stories of history, some things that I brought. Uh, so let me just start with, uh, let me just start with the, uh, the requests. Help us. <laughs> The people that I talk to every day, every day, um, most people don't understand, and I like it this way. I've stood in the very bright spotlight. Oh my gosh, <laughs> that's not a fun place to be. Most people don't know because we never, ever say it. The Blaze is now the largest streaming right of center media organization that does more viewership than anyone else in the world. Yeah. <clears throat> Please keep that to yourself. We don't like being targets. It's, it's so much better to fly under the radar. Um, I will tell you that that Homeland Security uh, message chilled me to the bone on Monday because we are winning, and that is a direct threat. That was a threat to people like Joe Rogan, me, Sean Hannity, Tucker Carlson, anybody who has a voice, and anyone who is willing to question. The thing that changed my life was Thomas Jefferson's letter to Peter Carr, his nephew. Peter Carr, his parents had died right before his father died. He went to Thomas Jefferson and said, you're the smartest man I know. Can you help educate my son? He said, yes, when he comes of age, I will. So he wrote this beautiful letter, and it covers everything. In mathematics, you have to know this. In philosophy, you have to know this. And read these books, and don't ever read anything out of its native tongue, because you'll lose too much. Uh, and then he, the last one is religion. And he said, above all things, when it comes to religion, Fix reason firmly in her seat and question with boldness even the very existence of God. For if there be a God, he must surely rather honest questioning over blindfolded fear. I know God is my father. I know as a father, I want my children to love me, but not because I tell them to love me because they have seen who I am. And if they don't know who I am or don't know why I've made a decision, I love it when my children come to me and say, Dad, that doesn't make sense to me. Why did you make that decision? It deepens our relationship. If God doesn't mind questioning, then why does our government? Because our government is not my God. But that is exactly what is happening. The woke left, the
the left ideology is a religion. And if you need any more evidence than what they've done to the cathedral in Paris, France, what they've done is made it into a church of wokeness, of equity, of the earth. That is their temple. And make no mistake, just like the priests of old, they will torture and kill, they will silence, they will take everything away from you, and you are not to ask questions. I'm the high priest. You'll come to me, and you, and you can't read it in your own language. It's in Latin, and I speak Latin, so I'll tell you what God says. That's exactly what's happening. And if you leave the doctrine, they don't care who you are. They will destroy you. This is the fight that we're in. They have been in it for a very long time. It's, it's interesting to be in a fight this long, to be in rounds, and rounds that seem to go on and on and on, because you will learn things along the way, and you'll think, this is really important, and then you'll set it down, because there's a couple of other rounds you're fighting, and then all of a sudden you'll find yourself in the ring again, and you'll be like, wait a minute. I saw you learn that punch in the third round. The Tides Foundation, when Ronald Reagan, this shows you the difference between the, um, the Republicans and the Democrats, and believe me, it's getting to a point I don't know the difference between the two, um, but the Republicans and the Democrats, the difference is we still don't want to control people. We still will occasionally listen to the American people. We are not elites. We are the people that actually believe, you know what, dude, if you want to do that, that's going to leave a mark, but have at it, okay? It's your life. And we actually believe if you do destroy yourself, if you do lose, it'll be the best thing that'll happen to you because you'll learn from it and you'll become a stronger individual and it'll put you on the path on where you're supposed to go unless you whine about it. <laughs> That's who we are. That is not who the left is. The left sees people as cattle, as sheep, and they are the shepherds. In the, in the 1980s, when Ronald Reagan came, it scared the crap out of both parties. If you were alive, you remember the same kind of thing with the GOP that was happening was happening with Donald Trump. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. He's an outsider. He's not playing the game like we like to play the game. Now, come on. No. And he did things that were really important. That is an evil empire. And that's exactly what our president should be saying about China today. That is an evil empire. He had moral clarity. And that's what people were looking for. Somebody who can just say, this is what they liked about Donald Trump. There's lots of things on the Twitter, you know, I got it. But one of the things I like about Donald Trump is he's like, nope, you suck. You're okay. You get out. That's what people are looking for, because that's what everybody does when they're talking among their friends. They're not like, well, you know, I think you're not so sucky. Um, that's really kind of a harsh word, and I'm going to have to think of another. No, you suck. That's how people talk. That's what they want to hear. They know this is not this complex. I don't know a single individual that's like, well, you know what? I'm glad we have more people studying the problem because I'm not sure I know what's caused inflation or the price of gas to go up. We all know what it is. Now just fix it. That's what people are saying. That's what people want. I will tell you, they're very frustrated very frustrated if the GOP gets in 
and runs it like Mitch McConnell likes to run it, we're all done. We're all done. The country is done. We are on the precipice. And we can easily go over the cliff. But the same breath that could push us over the cliff, coming this direction, can save us. It's a race to the end. The people are waking up. They are waking up. I wrote a book called The Great Reset. It is something two years ago I didn't really even know. And I thought it was nuts. Okay? I thought, no oh, way, this can't be happening. It sounds crazy. And there's a million reasons it shouldn't work, that they shouldn't be able to pull it off. But they have one thing that we don't have that CPI is doing, planning. We get out there and we're like, OK, well, now we've won. Now what should we do? I remember when Barack Obama came in and TARP came out, that bill was this big. I had it stacked on my desk in New York. I said, I'd like to read the bill. Three guys came in, poof, poof, poof. And I said, OK, I don't want to read the bill. I want all of you guys to read the bill. But I remember look, standing there and looking at it, I said, this was not written in the last 90 days. You can't write it. This has taken years to put together. <laughs> so here's my first request. Please tell me you're working on a plan. <laughs> OK? Because, <laughs> yes, good. Please tell me, please tell me it includes things like closing down the Department of Education. Please tell me, because I kind of appear, boy, have I let myself go. I, I do kind of appear like Santa Claus, so let me phrase it this way. Please tell me you're making a naughty and nice list. And that naughty list doesn't get coal, although they would hate that. They get, <laughs> they would get escorted out the door. It is time. It is the only way. They're going for the Great Reset. This is the way I feel. <laughs> that if we look at our system and the program is just kind of locked up on us, what do they always say? Have you tried unplugging it and plugging it back in? <laughs> and restore the factory settings. This thing is so overloaded with bull crap, you got to push the button or pull the plug and plug it back in and then go, OK, all right, wow, Bill, Bill of Rights, I can see that again. Why don't we work there? Let's start there. But you'll never be able to do it ever if you don't clean house. I didn't made me very uncomfortable when Donald Trump was talking about the deep state. Made me very uncomfortable. Because it sounds conspiratorial. But as I told him recently, the guy is a human hand grenade. And sometimes he blows up walls. And I think he's like, holy crap, what's behind that wall? You know, he was right on so many things. And the deep state, it's, it's real. And it's just bureaucrats that just Believe your sheep. Just believe they know better than you. You're too dumb to get it. And they have great tools. One of them, and if you read, um, I want to say it's Lippmann, but I don't think it is, uh, The Phantom Public, uh, written, does anybody, anybody? Wow, I'm a geek. Anyway, uh, it's a Woodrow Wilson era. Uh, book and it, it is all about the press and how to form public opinion and it came from you know advertising and they used to call it propaganda then you know the fascists got a hold of propaganda and then we went we should call it advertising but that's what it is it's propaganda and in that they talk about how to mold people how to how to partner 
with the press. You know, the Washington Press Corps, that dinner, that was started by Woodrow Wilson. That was to suck everybody in and bring them in instead of having an adversarial role. Hey, have you thought about sleeping with him or her? I think you'd make a lovely couple. <laughs> That's what we have. And it's their babies are everywhere. And it has to be cleaned out. It must be cleaned out. And somebody has to have the balls. And the Republicans have to have the balls. And they have to stand together and hold each other's arms just like Martin Luther King did in the name of freedom and liberty and justice and not sit down. I want to talk to you a little bit. Um, I put this book out three weeks ago. Fastest selling book I've ever had. I've sold, some of my books have sold over two million copies. Um, this is, this has taken everyone by surprise. The good news is there's a paper shortage. So we're out of books. Everybody keeps saying, that's the best problem. I'm like, no, it's not. How is that a good problem? But it has, in just a few weeks, it has changed so many people that are waking up to the Great Reset. I didn't know what it was. And at first, I was really confused because I thought we were fighting Marxists. Oh, the poor Marxists are going to be surprised. They're useful idiots. They are being used. They are being pushed out. And look, everybody look, see, we're going to go for Marxism. We're going to go for Marxism. No, we're not. I cannot believe I'm saying this, but do you know who our real enemy is? The big business all over the world, coupled with government, coupled with media. That's what's happening, and it makes sense. They all know, and banks. Does anybody, did anybody see the FOIA uh, results on the Fed? You know, you did? What did you say? Okay, good. Fantastic news. Fantastic. I mean, horrible news, but fantastic that we know about it. What did the Fed say they were going to bail the banks out? I mean, I love this. You know, you banks look like you're in trouble. You should, you should maybe, you should slow down and maybe take some money from the federal government. Then they take their coat off and go, well, we really don't want the money, but if you insist, Okay, we're going to give you money. It's the same people having the same conversation. The Fed is the bank. The bank is the Fed. So when they bail, the Fed bails the bank out, they take the money from here and put it in here. They said in 2008 and 2009 that they bailed the banks out to the tune of $5 trillion. And we were all outraged. We all went out in the streets and said, this is obscene. Yeah, you can't ask the Fed any questions for two years. National security, you know. So we had to wait till 2010. When we asked the question, the Fed took it all the way to the Supreme Court and said, we need at least 10 more years. Well, it's 2022. So the news is out. Strangely, no one has reported on it. The Fed didn't give the banks $5 trillion. They gave the banks, not just the US banks, but the banks in France, in England, and Germany, and here, $30 trillion. 30. Right before COVID, nobody was, nobody was explaining and so nobody was really talking about it. They were talking around it on CNBC. Something's wrong with the banks. The Fed is doing something they've never done before. They were issuing overnight loans. First to the tune of, I think it was $50 billion a night. And they could issue the loans. So the bank would say, here's $50 billion. OK, I'm going to pay you back. And there was money being made in that. And it didn't seem right. 
it said to me something's wrong with the financial sector more than corruption. Nobody got an answer on it. After the first week, the banks were asking for so much more. By April, this is now the beginning of COVID, when no one was paying attention. By April, they were issuing loans of $1.5 trillion a week. Now, what the hell is wrong with our banks that they need that kind of money? And is that money here? Or is that going overseas? Or is that maybe what explains inflation all over the West? Where is that money? Did they pay it back? Last I heard, I think they had, if you know, I think they had six months to pay it back. But the 30 trillion that they gave by 2010, experts say most of that was never paid back. This is the biggest heist in history. This is wealth redistribution. This is the Fed giving money to themselves as the banks, the banks then giving it to places like BlackRock, BlackRock then taking that money, and for the first time in history, the Fed is now taking some of that money, giving it to BlackRock and say, invest it in the stock market for us, the Fed. And so they're taking that money and buying stocks of corporations, which gives them controlling shares, gives them all kinds of power, and so you're going to have a couple of extra people on your board, Exxon. This is what's really going on. This is the transformation of America, the transformation of the West. It is a return to serfdom. Because there are people now between big tech. Think of this. You're in Congress. How many people have honestly thought the worst thing you could probably think? You don't have to raise your hand because there are cameras here. But how many have thought, if this keeps going, the people are going to rise up, and they're going to come with torches and pitchforks? OK? Yeah. Have you thought that? Of course you have. So has the media. So God help me. I'm telling you, if you're feeling that, the people who are taking the trillions of dollars in bailouts, the banks, do you think they think they're real popular with the people? Do you think big tech thinks they're real popular with the people, especially when big tech working on AI by 2030 will be responsible for 40% of our jobs gone globally? When you have an unemployment rate of 40% and everyone, everyone who knows about tech and AI agrees, by 2030, 40% unemployment. Do you think people are going to say, you know what, I love these people who are bringing AI into my neighborhood. They're not. And they all know it. You can read their own white papers. They all know trouble is coming. We are in what's called the fourth industrial revolution. I've explained this for 20 years. I said, there's going to come a time, guys, with tech. There's going to come a time that the, the industrial revolution that started with people on horses out farming and ended with people living in massive cities and factories pumping out refrigerators and cars, that took 100 years. This fourth industrial revolution is going to happen in 10. And I don't know when it's going to start, but it's going to happen fast. We're two years into it. That's what's happening. That's the friction. We are changing. The whole world is changing. And that's not a bad thing. It's only a bad thing if you lie to people, take their money, Make it so they close every door so you can't talk, you can't be at the table, you don't have an opinion, you don't know what's coming. That's when it's evil. And that's what's really happening. And the plan is called the Great Reset. 
I'm on my way this weekend to go up to Idaho. I am happy to report, sorry to say this, and I don't mean this about the Freedom Caucus, I really don't. Uh, I've given up on Washington. I've given up. I don't think it's going to be solved in Washington because the problems are too massive. Unless you guys really are serious and you will stand up like they did in the 1850s and say, neither one of you guys are serious. I see you Republicans. You say, oh, we're going we're gonna to slow down on the deficit. We're going to fight, fight, fight. And then you do nothing. You don't care. People care. The Republicans and the Democrats, we get more of the same crap every time. One's just in a speedboat and one's in a rowboat. I want to go the other direction. And when you have the balls to stand up, when you have the balls to stand up, and more importantly, when you can get a few Democrats who are not bad crazy to stand up with you and say, guys, I I'm a Democrat, but I love my country. When they stand up with you, and you can say, we're not playing your game anymore. I, when I was at Fox, I was asked, do you know what your problem is? I said, I mean, how much time do you have? <laughs> you know what your problem is? You won't play the game. You know what my response was? It's not a game to me, nor is it a game to millions of Americans. That's why you feel pitchforks and torches. They're not playing around. And if you think 7.5% inflation is bad, wait. Because what they have done is unimaginable. Unimaginable. And it all leads to the Great Reset. It all leads to a new Fed coin. And it's actually not called a Fed coin. Look this up. I believe it's called the Hamilton Project. The Federal Bank uh, of Boston, along with MIT, are working on the new Fed coin. And uh, I'm sure it's going to come soon. Uh, but that traps everyone, along with ESG. 20 states, 20 states in just the last few weeks have either started and or passed and signed in legislation against ESG. How many people know what ESG is? Okay. How many feel comfortable that I could ask you questions about it and you would be able to answer those questions? Some of them. Okay, a couple of them. Good. Everyone in this room, this is the Rosetta Stone to their plan. If you don't stop and you don't understand what they're doing with ESG, you will not win. And again, it's a race against the clock because they are way ahead of us, way ahead. Why did everybody freak out? You can stop me at any time because I know I'm probably going to run very long, <laughs> so I'm sorry. Uh, why was everybody so freaked out about the Paris Climate Accords? Why did, right after the election, so many big, huge global businesses proudly say, yeah, well, we worked as hard as we could to get Donald Trump out of there. Do you remember that? Yeah. That was kind of unusual. You're kind of like, what? wait, what? I thought you made shoes. <laughs> OK? Why did that happen? All of this is uh, the Paris Climate Accords was not about global warming. It was about the five days before the climate meeting. The five days before in Paris, all of the big banks of the world and the, the central banks of the world all got together and drew up what we now know is ESG. We could put this in. It's why they say we're never going back to normal. Why people are talking now about stakeholder capitalism. It's not stakeholder capitalism. I don't even know what that is. Stop saying it's capitalism because it's not. It has nothing to do with the free market. It is fascism. Don't confuse that with rounding people up, although I wouldn't count that out. 
But don't confuse that with the 1930s fascism. When I say fascism, I mean it is the government in a public-private partnership telling the businesses what to do, and then they just stand back and say, look, we're headed toward a green new world, and we're, we're looking for cooperation on a few things, and you guys work that out. Meanwhile, under the Fed's tutelage, which the central banks are the banks, they say, you know what? We can't risk loaning people money. We can't, you know that Joe Rogan, Spotify, I mean, this is trouble because that makes you unstable because he could do one thing and pull off the air and you've lost $100 million. How do we know our money is going to be safe investing in you? Don't hire him. That's what it is. That's what's going on. That's why Exxon, Exxon. How in, the, in anyone's right mind would you put environmentalists who hate fossil fuels on the board of directors for Exxon? Why? Listen, Exxon, I mean, it's going to be a new green world. And you're living in the past. And I'm not sure we as a bank, or any of the banks, or quite honestly, any of the hedge funds, we can't invest in you. We can't loan money to you. Because when the green new era begins, all of our money that we've invested will collapse. You have to come along with us, or you won't get any money. Now, some of the states are making or passing laws against the E part of ESG. How about the rest of us? E is all about the environment. S is social justice. And G is governance. If you go to the websites of the banks, if anybody has an investment, I urge you to go look at wherever you have your investment and you will see that most likely you have an ESG score. When I talked to Citibank and said a year ago, why would you do that? Why, why are you, through your uh, financial services, why are you giving people like me an ESG score when I'm just an investor? Their answer, we're just trying to be helpful. We know people are really they care about these issues, and they might want to know. And I said, ha, 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 ha. And so you're never going to say to me that I can't get a house loan because I'm not green enough, or my job makes me a risk. You'll never say that. Oh, my gosh, never. They're doing it today. They're doing it today. This is, that's why he will not give up on his Build Back Better bill. I mean, when I heard that, I didn't know that that is the actual slogan developed in Davos by the World Economic Forum. It's a, I mean, that's, that makes sense to me, because I heard Build Back Better, and I'm like, this guy is senile. I mean, that's the worst slogan I've ever heard. Build Back Better. We're going to Build Back Better. Nobody, that wasn't catching on. They kept using it. And then I saw, wait a minute, the Prime Minister of England is using it. And so is the head of France and Japan. They're all passing the exact same legislation. The, the sugar is, wow, you're struggling. You can't afford food. You probably can't afford daycare. They are creating the problem to get the people to say, I got to have this help, you evil Republicans. I have to have. That's smoke. It's the machine that they are building. Once they have all of the pieces in, by the way, did you notice, you know, they're, oh, we're not going to do that bank thing where we, if you have $10,000, we really wanted that. But you know what? You guys made a good point. Made a good point. Did you notice a piece of that has been passed in another bill? It was in another bill. Nobody even noticed or talked about it because nobody even knows what it is. Now, if you do any business with PayPal or anything online, guess who has 
access to your banking statements. Why do they want that? Because we are now in modern monetary theory. Who knows about that? Okay, please, I'm, ba I'm, I'm seriously, I'm not, nobody knows this stuff. But if you don't educate yourself, and I mean right now, if you are not back next week in Washington with knowledge of this, we are going to lose. Modern monetary theory sounds like something that is coming from a nursery school, okay? The idea is we can print as much money as we want. The first time I heard that, I'm like, no, you can't. And they're like, no, we can. It's modern. It's a modern monetary. It's not like they did in Germany or Zimbabwe or all those other places. This is modern. OK, what's the theory? Again, the government can print as much as it wants. So the taxes would be real high? No, dummy, this is modern. We don't even need taxes, because we're the government. As long as we can print the money, we can spend the money. OK, how do you stop inflation? Well, that's part two. Part two requires you to penalize people that are taking the economy in directions that will lead to high inflation. Gas prices are so high. Now, let me use an example. Of, well, first, let me tell you the, the last piece, the piece they don't have yet, is insight and control of people's money. That's why Bitcoin is so vital. They will come up with the Fed coin. The government has done this before. We, it, generally, you will lose between 40, 30 to 55% of your cash, OK? The dollar collapses. We, this has happened before. They say, trade it in for a new dollar. You get 60 cents on your dollar. And then everybody gets the same. No, 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 not now, according to the Treasury's own writings, this time it will be equity. So you like shoes, you like money. What's your ESG score? Not good, but you are a minority. So I'm going to give you 45 cents on your dollar, where Glenn Beck, who just has it all, he's going to get 30 cents on the dollar. And somebody who is a cripple hermaphrodite that is 700 different races, they're going to get $1.20 on their dollar. It's all equity. This is the world they are building. And if you don't believe me, I urge you, do not. I have in my book, I have 30 pages or 50 pages of fine print uh, footnotes, and none of them take you to somebody's opinion. All of it takes you directly back either to the central banks of Europe, the, the Federal Reserve here in America, the World Economic Forum, or the people involved. Much of those footnotes takes you to whitehouse.gov. Okay? Do not go down the rabbit hole, because this, be this will be the undoing. Do not go down the rabbit hole of listening to other people, even me, talk about it. You must know it from the source. That's the only way you'll be able to defeat it. I beg you. That's my ask. I beg you. Let me tell you quickly some good news. People are waking up. They are waking up. We are entering a great awakening. <clears throat> I have looked for this. I have begged people, please wake up, for 15 years. And the Tea Party, I thought we were, it wasn't it. This is real, because this is crossing all barriers. And it started with Afghanistan. Afghanistan was so obscene, and we've never seen Americans act that way. And I remember when I got on the air, it was a Wednesday, and I had asked my charity, we go over and rescue Christians. And I said, 
it was Tuesday night, can you tell me a number that it's going to take to just go get some of these people out of here? Maybe 3,000 people? They called me the next morning and they told me on the air, live, the number is 20 million. And I'm like, what? 20 million, and Glenn, if we're going to do it, we need it by Friday. And in my head, I'm like, that's never going to happen. But I said, OK, well, let's do it. We had $23 million by Friday. In the end, we had almost $50 million in three weeks. Okay, People don't want to be told they can't do it. They're looking for somebody who stands up to say, screw all those people. If they won't do it, we'll do it, because we're Americans. That's good news. And they are waiting for you. They are waiting for you. They are looking for leadership. And if it doesn't come from Washington, it will come elsewhere. But I do pray to God that it is measured and Martin Luther King in its approach. But if a leader does not appear soon, it's not going to end well for any of us. And they, they want the violence. They say, this is conspiracy theory about the voting. I can guarantee you, when their butts are kicked, that's all they'll be saying next year, is that the election was stolen by the Republicans. They don't mean a word they say. Let me leave you with a couple of stories here. My son, when he was nine, uh, he was taking Taekwondo. And growing up at my hip, he has seen far too many things that he shouldn't have seen. He has seen the way people think their dad is a hero, which is not true, and the way people think that I'm the devil incarnate, which is not true. I'm neither of those things. But I'll never forget my son asking me for the first time, Dad, why does it seem, why does it seem like so many people hate you? And I'm like, because we're in Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> and so he had an aversion to crowds and people, and he wanted nothing to do with it. So he's going to get his first belt, Taekwondo. And we pull up, and he sees there are other parents there watching their kids. And he freaks out. I don't know. No, I don't want to be in front of the people. I don't want to be in front of people. And I had a real parenting crisis. I didn't know how to deal with it. I said, you know what? Get in the car. We'll go home. And all the way home, I'm thinking, how do I teach him that he's got to do certain things? I brought him into my office, which I have heroes all over the walls uh, of my office. And, and we sat down on the couch, and I said, son, why do I have all of these people on my walls? And he rolled his eyes, and he said, because they're all heroes, and they did the tough thing. And I said, no, that's not why. I have them because most of the time they were doing what they thought they had to do. They were terrified. They knew that this could end their life. They knew this would not make them popular. They knew the opposition that they would face. But somehow or another, they did it. And I, I feel this way, and I know you feel this way. I, I don't know if I'm going to be the guy in Saving Private Ryan that's going to stand on the stairs and weep and not be able to shoot my gun. I don't know. None of us know until you're in the battle. But I surround myself with people not as heroes, but as men and women who I don't know how they did it, and neither did they at the time. They just knew. They knew who their God was. They knew who they were. And they knew, I'm not, I'm not facing my maker when I have the opportunity 
to at least help. I'm not going to end my life as a coward. So let me show you some courageous people. This is actually, um, this is actually the, the thing that got the pilgrims here to America. They wrote all kinds of books while they were in Holland, and they would put a, a seal on so everybody knew, oh, those, are the, those are the people who are going to become the pilgrims. Those are those guys. And, uh, and they had to have these things printed all over Europe and then assembled. This one doesn't have the seal on it because they knew when they wrote it, the king is going to hate this. And this basically talks about how, yeah, king, king, king's not God, and the church is wrong, and they're wrong on these things. Those people, when the king read this, he hunted them. And that's why they had to leave a very popular and safe country in Holland. They were prosperous in Holland. But because they told the truth, and they knew they would face it, they had to come to what had to be almost certain death crossing the ocean. Those people were amazing, but they knew who they were. <clears throat> this is what the Chief Justice held in front of Ronald Reagan when he took the oath of office the first time. And I brought it because you guys take very similar oaths. And I would love to know that you guys in hard times, repeat that oath to yourself. I, Ronald Reagan, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. He fought his battles with the State Department. You know, when he went over to Germany, they kept taking Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall out of the speech over and over and over again. Mr. President, you can't say that. It'll cause a war. Mr. President, blah, 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 blah. It wasn't in the prompter. And he told him, I'm saying it. You can't say it, Mr. President. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And what happened? Because he spoke the truth, the wall came down. There's power in the truth. There is protection in the truth. This is Schindler's List. When I was over in the Middle East, I understood Oscar Schindler like I've never understood. I wasn't at risk like he was. But we had the means and ability. And I know you're going to kill those people. What do you want? You want my ring? You want my watch? What do you want? Take it. Give me those people. They mean nothing to you. The torment that people in the past, the torment that people in the Middle East feel today, the torment that people feel in China today, of these people mean nothing to you. Just let them leave. Most people won't stand because they're afraid it will happen to them. Well, good. We'll meet our maker sooner. And at least he'll, he'll welcome us with good job. Good job. You screwed a few things up, but... <laughs> One last story. My wife gave this to me for Christmas years ago. She had it wrapped up. It was Christmas. And I thought we were done with presents. And she came up to me and she said, OK, there's one more present for you uh, here. And then she stopped. And I reached out for her. She said, no, I can't give it to you today. And I said, why? And she said, because it's Christmas. And you'll spend all day crying. <laughs> and I said, no, I won't. And she said, yes, you will. I said, I won't. It's Christmas. I opened it up, and I, I spent the whole day crying. <laughs> this is called a Schutz Pass. This is signed 
by one of the greatest men that I have found in history. His name was Raoul Wallenberg. Does anybody know who he was? He's a man who had everything going for him. He was a Norwegian living with a family, the Wallenberg's great name. Um, they were uh, leaders, store owners. He had the world at his fingertips. And the United States of America went to him and said, in Budapest, we need some eyes on the ground because we think they're, they're rounding up Jews and we need somebody to see what's going on and you can get in. Will you do it at our request? He went and he saw what was going on. And when he did, he couldn't wait around for people to save them. So he made thousands of these, signed them, stamped them. A Schutz Pass said, this person no longer has to wear a yellow star because this person now is from my country. This person has the protection of my king. They were occupied by Germany. The king called, what are you doing? You're killing us. He's like, if you want me to stop, you will have to come and remove me yourself. This man was so passionate that he would print these and he would get up on top of the train cars full of Jews and he would stuff them in between the slots and say, give them to everybody. Make sure everyone in this car has one. And then he'd run up to the coal and he'd say, stop the train. You have taken my people. You have the wrong people. And the Germans would stop the train and they would have everybody come out and God help anyone who didn't have one of these. He did it day after day after day. He was asked, this is one of the last ones he gave. He was asked by a few of the last Jews, please come with us, Mr. Wallenberg, please. The Russians are coming. His quote, the Russians cannot be as bad as the Germans. He was last seen run, running to a, um, a squadron of Russians Years later, at an auction, I found something that was really worthless to most people. It's a cigarette box. And it was carried by somebody in that group of Russians that Raoul Wallenberg was running to because they can't be as bad as the Germans. In Russian, it says, let's kill all the Jews and go home. We don't know what happened to Raoul Wallenberg. We know he was either shot on the spot, which would have been a blessing. We don't think that happened because Stalin hated him and wanted to interrogate him himself. There's a story that he died in a concentration camp in about 1952, and there is, a, there is a, another story that he died in a concentration camp in 1971. I'm praying that one isn't true. I'm telling you this story because here's a man who did the right thing, gave the ultimate sacrifice because he believed in what America said. He believed it was noble and he did it himself. And in the end, we waited until Ronald Reagan before someone would ask the Russians, whatever happened to Raoul Wallenberg? We live in a great and exciting time. The world is changing. And if we don't lose our heads, it's going to be amazing. The technology that we have, the things that we can do and explore, the diseases that we can cure, Life, human life, will never be the same. But just like everything else, it's what people choose to do with that opportunity. It's going to take strength beyond what you think you have.
But I'm telling you right now, you were called for this time. You were called to either stand, you were called to finance, you were called to write, to plan, to speak, to die, whatever it is, you are here for a reason. And all of the eyes of the world are upon you and me and everyone else. They are going to write about this time period in history when it's all said and done for centuries. What will they write about those of us who either sat on our hands, weren't informed enough, and lost, or how for the first time in human history, a group of people turned it around in the end and pulled freedom out of the evil jaws of dictatorship one more time. Thank you, God bless.